Good morning. Good to be here. Hey, Jim. You snuck in. Ah, it's always good to be back. Thank you again for the invitation, even though it was last seconds. Uh, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. It, um, you know, the, the scriptures say to be ready in season and out of season, right? Uh, to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. And, and uh, that's what I hope to do this morning. Uh, when I come here, I'd like to give you a little bit of a ministry update of what uh, I'm involved in. You folks have supported my ministry for many, many years, which we are extremely grateful for. And we thank you very much for your support to our ministry. Uh, my ministry entails prison. Uh, visiting guys who are incarcerated at Concord, uh, mostly at Concord, and I teach there every week. Um, and there's the doors are still open. Prison doors are open right now. Praise God. Continue to pray that prison doors stay open uh, for uh, the public to be able to go in. Uh, we are also involved in Men's First Monday, the first Monday of each month for the next four months. There is uh, We're going through the book, Unoffendable. Are you easily offended? Are people offended these days? And, and uh, so we're going through this book by uh, Brant Hansen, Unoffendable, on Monday nights, men only. Okay. Um, usually it cause, causes something when I say that. But men's first Monday. And um, stay tuned to my email if, if you're interested in going to that. And we have a great meal cooked by a famous cook, Eric Hansen. And uh, the food is great. The fellowship is phenomenal. It's on Monday nights, the first Monday at Trinity Church in Bolton. It starts at 6 for food, 7 for the speaker. This coming month, February 7th, I will be speaking. There is a, a clipboard in the back on the table with a couple of my ministry uh, letters. You're welcome to, if, if, if you're interested in going or interested in any of the Bible studies I do, you're welcome to put your name on there and just say, hey, I'd like to know more about First Monday or whatever. Also involved in home Bible studies throughout the week, Zoom meetings right now with a couple different uh, men's groups, uh, Zoom meetings, a meeting with people from, Zoom has really actually opened up a new door uh, from guys all over the world. So I'm very thankful for that. I have a couple guys uh, from England showing up, couple, uh, three guys from Florida showing up, uh, people that normally I wouldn't have an opportunity to talk to. So I'm very thankful for that. And um, in March, don't know have a date yet, but I will be doing a workshop called Lifestyle Evangelism, sharing your faith with a purpose, and sharing your faith in such a way that in your everyday life, what does it look like? And I would like to encourage people who maybe fear the word evangelism or sharing your faith, I'd like to encourage you to come. It's, a, it's usually about three hours on a Saturday morning. We'll be doing it in March in Shrewsbury at um, one... Uh, family church, but my newsletter will have information on that as, as we bring it all together. This morning, I would like to talk about lifestyle evangelism. What I've done is taken this three-hour um, workshop, and I'm going to bring it to you and hopefully in just maybe two hours. No, no, uh, no I'll, I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, and, and we're going to talk about sharing your faith. And what does that look like? Because I know it's hard for a lot of people to share their faith. So we'll be talking more about that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and just to look at, at you. And Lord, help us to fall in love with you. Because we know that as, as we have a relationship with you, then everything else goes well. We love you and thank you. Amen. The key verse I've picked out here. Uh, it's, it's my go-to verse for sharing my faith. It's found in Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. And as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bear and sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goeth forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Every time you give out God's word, it will accomplish something. You have to be thinking about this all the time. This verse is our promise. It's our foundational promise that when you give God's word out, no matter how you do that, it is going to accomplish something. That should just encourage you 
because you might be thinking, oh, I'm not that smart. I'm not that intelligent. I don't have these verses read uh, or memorized, and I, I just don't know how to do this or whatever. This is our foundational verse. If you can get the word out, it will accomplish something. God's promise is his word. The power is in his word, not in us. It's not how good we are, not how smart we are, not how articulate you are, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. I titled this message Lifestyle Evangelism because I, I believe that sharing the message of the cross and our Lord Jesus Christ should be done in conjunction with your everyday life. It shouldn't just be a one-time thing. I go out weekly or whatever. I share my faith on Sunday or whatever. This should be a day-in and day-out lifestyle. When you're getting your hair cut, it's a perfect time because they, the person cutting your hair, can't go anywhere. They're stuck, and they somewhat have to agree with you or they don't get a tip. <laughs> it's an excellent opportunity to share your faith. Uh, going to the store um, at... at Lowe's or stop and shop or, or at work. You should be an evangelist. You should be sharing your faith or at least your relationship with God with these people. It's a scary topic, evangelism. For me, it comes very easy, but that's only because God hasn't gifted me with the desire uh, to evangelize. I love sharing my faith with those around me. We're not all in gifted in that area. Some of you folks are gifted in ministration. Some of you are gifted in service. Some of you are gifted in giving. But we're all required to be, to, to be functioning in the gifts that the Holy Spirit has, has given us, the world. In some way or some form, you need to be functioning as a giver, as a service worker, as a pastor, pastoring those around you, as an evangelist, sharing your faith. If it wasn't for evangelism... None of you would be here today. Every single one of you, somebody has shared the gospel with. Might have been your mom, your dad, family member. God brings church growth and personal growth um, through evangelism. And it glorifies God. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise, it says in Proverbs 11.30. James 5.20, let him know that the one who has turned a sinner from his error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. As you turn a sinner from his sins, you've covered a multitude of sins and you've saved a sin, uh, a soul from death. So I'd like to encourage you this morning to be involved or at least to be consciously involved that as I woke up this morning, how can God use me today to be a witness? I don't have all the answers. In fact, I don't know that anybody does. There's all kinds of methods and, and ways of sharing your faith with others, and I would encourage you to look into those different methods and ways and to listen to, to, to how other people have shared their faith with others. But everybody will agree that if you do not show care and concern for others, you will not be effective. You have to show care and concern for those around you. It's important to understand what the heartbeat of God is. If God was here today and you could ask him, what is your heartbeat? He would answer with th 3 John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. God is a, God, a relational God. He desires to have a relationship with each and every one of you. He loves you as an individual son or daughter. He loves you that much, just like you would love your sons and daughters, or you do. And we, and we aren't even very good at loving. We're not all that great. It's easy to love those who love you. But we do love our children, and God loves us more than that. So the heartbeat of God is to have relationships. Adam and Eve, the first two people created, they broke their relationship with God. And what did God do? It says that he called out to man. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, it says that he called out. After they disobeyed him and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they disobeyed his direct command, yet God still called after them. He went after them. 
He loves you that much. When a man sins, he hides from God. Adam and Eve, as soon as they sinned, as soon as they disobeyed God, they went and hid themselves, and then they tried covering themselves with leaves because of their shame, because they have broken fellowship. And that's the way we are. That's a picture of us. It's a picture of everybody in the entire world. They've covered up. They are hiding themselves from God. But you know what? God still seeks us out. Sin causes fear, and people are living in fear. All day long, everybody you come in contact with, at the store, at work, whatever, people are living in fear. But God promises us, as, as a passage that, that Steve read, promises us to be our strength, our shield, our protector, and to bless us with good. In the next chapter of Genesis, chapter 4, we see Cain. He disobeys God in bringing the proper sacrifice. And what's he do? He, he runs away. He's angry. He's downcast. His face is downcast because God rejected his sacrifice. And instead of asking God, okay, what did I do wrong? And forgive me for doing what I shouldn't have done. He didn't. He got angry. And so God goes after him. He chases after him. God goes after Cain and says, why are you angry? Why is your face, face downcast? If you do what is right, you will be lifted up. But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. God is going after him as in tremendous love, saying, Cain, if you do what is right, your countenance will be lifted. Your face will be lifted. But if you continue in sin, you're going to be angry. You're going to be downcast. You're going to be head, hanging your head in shame. God went after him. In the very next verse, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, um, if, in verse 7 it says, And if you do what is right, you will be lifted up. Verse 8 says, Cain went out from that conversation and killed his brother Abel. The next verse. And what happened? God went after him. Verse 8. God sought him out and said, Where's your brother Abel? He wanted him to confess his sin. He said, What? I'm not my brother's keeper. He was angry. He was an angry man. Verse 16, probably one of the saddest verses in all the scripture says, so Cain went out from the Lord's presence. He walked away from God. There's nothing that you can do to make God give up on you. You must give up on him. In Revelation chapter 3, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. God is standing at the door of your heart today. If you're watching this by, by video or, or you're here among us today and, and you've never invited God into your life, he is knocking at the door ready to be invited in. He is not going to force himself upon you because that's not true love. Nor will he receive love if he forced himself upon you. This is something he is inviting you to do. Invite me into your house, into your life. I will come in and have an intimate relationship with you. I'll come in and dine with you and you with me. Do you know what that feels like? We have children that, that might be prodigal, right? I have a son that a few, um, six months, some of you might have heard this story before, six, eight months ago. I can't remember. I'm not good at time. But I went to his house, and he has these big glass sliding doors that go into his living room. And he's in there on the couch, and he's watching uh, the Bruins game. And he knows I love hockey and uh, all the fights. I love the fights. And, okay. and so I, I'm standing there and leaning up against the, this wall of glass, and he's watching. He's, he looks up. Hi, Dad. How are you? I'm like, fine. How are you doing? And what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm watching a game. And, and, he, and he just continues watching the game. Oh, I, I wanted to be invited in. I wanted to be invited in. 
I just stood there just saying, please invite me in to watch the game with you. He, you know, I don't care about the game. I could care less about the Bruins. They're going to be here and then gone tomorrow. Who cares? My son. I wanted to sit next to my son and watch the game. I never got invited in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Have you ever invited Christ into your life? He wants so dearly to be with you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the sin in your life. He doesn't care about it. He wants to have love relationship with you. He will deal with the sin. He will deal with those issues in your life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. So I'm going to give you four principles about sharing your faith with those around you. The number one principle for sharing your faith around you is found in John 15, 4 to 8. It's a f- remain in me, and I'll remain in you. Listen to how many times he says remain. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. So you have this picture of a, a, a tree or a vine or whatever, and you take that branch and you break it off the tree. It, it can no longer produce fruit. It has no life flowing into it because it has to remain in the tree, in the bush, in order for water to, the water to go up inside to, to, to produce fruit. So this is the picture he's given you. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers and such branches are picked up and they're only good for burning in the fire. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So the number one principle for sharing your faith is you have to remain in the vine. You have to remain in Christ. If you're not eating and taking in God's word weekly, daily, you're not going to have anything to give. You won't be able to take from the water of life, the well of life, to be fruitful. Principle number two, people have come to Christ through prayer. But when he saw the disciples, um, the multitudes in Matthew chapter 9, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. The second principle after abiding in him is be men and women of prayer. We need to be praying for those around us, praying for those you come in contact with every day, praying that you might be a witness and a testimony to them. Prayer, it's an integral part of sharing your faith with those around you. You might say, well, where is the harvest field? It says... Um, Pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest send out laborers into his harvest. There are certain harvest fields you can't work in, but you can pray. You might have brothers and sisters or moms or dads or whatever living in other states or other countries, friends. You can pray for them. Pray that God will send forth a labor into that harvest field. I've done it many a time throughout my life, and I have seen fruit from that. One day, my mother-in-law uh, said that she started walking with a lady in her neighborhood, and they lived down in Boone's Mill, Virginia, North Carolina, wherever, down there, down there somewhere. And uh, she said, this lady that I walk with wants to get to meet you. And I'm like, why would a lady that you walk with down in Boone's Mill want to know who I am? Well, come to find out she's a Christian. And as my mother-in-law and her walk through the neighborhood, their exercise, she finds out that her this lady's son-in-law is a preacher of some kind, and, and she's like, oh, I want to meet this guy. So God listened to that prayer and sent a labor into that harvest that I can't, I can't work in. 
Say not, ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white unto harvest. You know, right now, the fields are white unto harvest. There's somebody you're going to come in contact with today, this week, that is ready to be plucked. Ready. They're just, God is going to bring you into their life, and you're going to be able to speak into their life. The fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Pray. So we see that we need to abide in him. We also see that we need to be men and women of prayer. Another principle, principle number three, eating from God's word daily. Second Timothy says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped in every, what? Good work. It's a good work to be involved in sharing your faith with those around you. It's God's word that we need to be taking in. God's word gives us life. It says in John 6, 63, it is a spirit who gives life and the flesh provides no benefit. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. If we're not taking in God's word, we're losing out on life. The fear of the Lord is a beginning of wisdom. Psalm 111.10. God's word gives us wisdom. I can, do all, um, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13, God gives us strength through taking in his word. God gives us knowledge. Proverbs, it says, 2.6, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. Come knowledge and understanding. You want wisdom and knowledge? You need to be in God's word. We need to be abiding in him. People come to Christ through prayer and eating from God's word. And I'm convinced that sometimes that we don't pray, that God um, go, uh, God use, that, that, that sometimes we don't pray to be a witness because we're afraid that God is going to do it. You know? It's like, I won't know what to say. And we're afraid to pray that prayer. But God asks us, pray that prayer. Don't worry about it. I'll work in this. So a fourth principle is to trust God at his word. To know, we already know that the fields are white under harvest. Trust that. Believe that. Have that in the back of your heart and mind. The Lord is not slow about his promises, it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. He is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. God does not desire any to perish but all come to repentance. You and I desire that certain people perish. We do. You, you don't want to say that. I mean, you never say that. But I mean, there's certain people that you know or you've come in contact with, if you heard about on the news or whatever, and you can say that person deserves to die. God doesn't. Why? Because we were all created in his image, and he doesn't want his image stained. God desires that all come to repentance. Believe that. This is what God says. These four principles need to be a part of our everyday lives. It, it sets a foundation in our life, abiding in him, prayer, eating from God's word, and trusting God's word by faith. We are all called to share our personal testimony of what God has done for us. Don't worry about what God hasn't done for you. What has God done for you? That's your testimony. That's what you share with people, how God has been a blessing to you. Evangelism is simply sharing your experiences with a purpose. That's all. You have a backdoor purpose that I want to share my faith in such a way. I remember sharing with my barber, the guy cutting my hair one day, and, and um, I figured he was trapped. He couldn't go anywhere. And I started just talking about life and, and, and issues of life. And he was very political. He wanted to talk politics. And I didn't really want to talk politics. And so I was sharing my faith. And, and then I noticed another gentleman came in and he sat down. And I thought, well, you know what? I might as well share loud enough that he benefits from this conversation. That's called third-person evangelism. They're hearing the word even though they're not part of the conversation. That barber did come to Christ and lead his sister to Christ and his brother to Christ and has just gone out. 
very good friend of mine today, and now I get free haircuts. God has chosen us to be lights and witnesses to the world. It says, everyone who is called on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God loves it. He thinks our feet are beautiful when we bring good news. That's in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. We should be involved in supporting pastors and missionaries and others to be able to function in the most important role in all the universe, and that is introducing others to Jesus Christ. There's other people in different harvest fields, as we we mentioned earlier, praying for them, helping them, encouraging them. But not all missionaries are... um, but not everybody is a missionary or a pastor. Uh, but everyone should be sharing their faith still with the world in some way, somehow. So why should we do this? Acts 1.8 says, you have, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the power of God himself is in your life, and you are going to be witnesses. You'll be witnesses here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. Another reason for sharing your faith is you'll receive rewards. In Matthew 25, 21, this is something I just long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things, but I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. See, the joy of our master is that we produce fruit. You want to please God? You share share him with others. He desires none to perish. Sharing God will also help our spiritual growth. It says over and finally, I love this, this verse, I always thank God, thank my God, as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. That's a beautiful verse. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full or a fuller understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. As you share your faith with those around you, you're going to have a fuller understanding of everything we have. It's it's one of the blessings of sharing. It pleases God is another reason why we should be sharing our faith with those around him. He has given us a few different parables uh, about the, the lost sheep or the lost coin or the lost, the prodigal son. In the parable of the lost coin, it says something interesting in verse 8. Luke 15, verse 8, it says, or suppose a woman has 10 coins. Okay, she lost one. And in the same way, when she finds this coin, he says, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Did you catch the word presence? It says here, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. So who's rejoicing? God is. Jesus Christ is rejoicing because he's writing, there is is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God is just waiting for one sinner to turn and look to him. And God's like, yes! And Jesus Christ probably do a knuckle or a high five or whatever. It says it in his word. What hinders us from sharing our faith? You know, one teenage kid, I I teach, every summer I teach at a youth camp, and uh, a teenager, I remember a teenager coming up to me. He says, he says, oh, he says, you know, I'm so fearful of sharing my faith. He says, "Um, when do you get over that? He didn't like my answer. I said, you never really get over it. You get comfortable with it maybe, but you still have that little bit of, you know, reservation. You might look stupid maybe in front of that person or you, you know, which is pride. We concern ourselves about how we look to other people. We look dumb. Many times I've had to dumb myself in front of others. I don't care anymore. 
But it's, it's hard. I'm not going to say it's easy. Maybe we lack in faith and we don't believe God's word where he says that he'll give us the words to say. He says, I will give you the words to say. Don't worry about that. It says in Matthew chapter 10, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what you, you want, um, about what to say or how to say it. At the time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. See, it's God's word that speaks. It's not us. Who is it? Uh, Theodore Roosevelt has a quote. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Do you care for people around you? Or do you get frustrated? It's easy to get frustrated. As you stand in line waiting or somebody pulls out in front of you or takes your parking space, it's easy. I don't naturally love people. That's something you have to ask God for. Love comes from God. God is love. This is not something we can just muster up in ourselves. We have to ask him to love others. Jane has many, many times said to me, you know, I just don't know how to carry on a conversation with somebody. She is the quiet one. And, and she's like, I just don't know how to, to carry on a conversation, start a conversation. And, and there's um, a, a good book out, uh, at least it's good, to, I thought it was good for me. And it's called Questioning Evangelism. Sharing your faith with questions. You might not know what to say, but just ask questions. People love to talk about themselves. Ask them about their family, their kids, their, their, their job, you know. Ask them about life, and they love to talk. Usually you can bring people out if you ask questions. You don't have to have all this knowledge in your head. Remember, it's not our work. It's God's work to save people. We have a farmer in Mark chapter 4, verses 3 to 20. He sows seed. And this is a beautiful story. If you can picture it in your head, a farmer has, has his pouch of seed, and, and he throws the seed out. Some of the seed lands on a path, and, and it gets trampled upon or eaten up. Other seed lands in rocky places, and it doesn't have any soil, and the sun comes down and scorches it, and it just dies out. Other seed finds, uh, finds itself among thorns and, and, and very difficult parts of life, um, and it doesn't bear grain. But some seed that is sown falls on good soil. 30, 60, or even 100 times it produces. The farmer sows the word. That's what it's a picture of, sowing the seed. You know what the Bible doesn't say? It doesn't say that the farmer did a terrible job. Immediately, I'm thinking, well, he should probably put seed on just the good soil and just not on the rocky path. Don't be so, you know, scatterbrained. Just, just keep it. You know, that's my thinking. It doesn't say the farmer did a lousy job. It says that he just scattered seed. So it's not the farmer that's a bad farmer. It's the soil that the seed lands on. And you have no idea the soil in the life of others. You have no idea what the soil is that your seed is falling into. We're just told to scatter seed. There's another story of a farmer in Mark chapter 4. This is what the kingdom of God is like, verses 26 to 29. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk and then the head, then the kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. He sows the seed, he goes to sleep, and it grows. He doesn't know how it's done. That's the way it is with us as we sow God's word out to others. God's not concerned about our abilities. He's not concerned about your ability because it's not you anyway. It's his seed. It's his word. What he's concerned about is our availability. Here am I, Lord. Send me. He used a donkey uh, to save a prophet from death. He used a donkey's jawbone to fight off a thousand men. He used the prayer of a man up on a mountain to defeat an army in a valley. He used empty pots and torches and trumpets to scatter an innumerable army that was, that had, was as the scripture said, 
was as big as the sand on the seashore. He used 300 men with empty vessels, torch, you have this empty vessel, you have the light, which is the word of God, and trumpet speaking out, Gideon, to scatter tens of thousands of men, armed men. He's not concerned about your ability. You know, as I was, uh, some of you have heard this story. I was at a um, dermatologist and a young guy, and he's super intelligent, super intelligent. I mean, this kid was unbelievable. And, and we got into these conversations that you probably shouldn't get into it if you're a doctor, you know, because doctors, you know, usually try to keep, you know, stoic faces and be businesslike and everything. Otherwise, you don't trust them or whatever. I don't know. They play this game. And, and so this kid was super intelligent. Every time I would hit him with a, an issue, he would talk about one of our issues in our world, you know, abortion or, or overpopulation or the, the world heating up or all these things. And I would say, well, you know, the Bible says this or, you know, and I'm thinking, I can't spar with this guy because he would come back with unbelievable arguments fantastic arguments. And here I am trying to spar with him. I can't on an intellectual level. I can't. He's so far beyond me. And he's coming out with these arguments, and I'm like, wow, he's got me there. Ooh, he's got me there. And, and, and so I had this, this thing on my face that he was cutting off, and, and so he put this white cloth over my face and cut a hole in it so he could work on that, that thing, dermatologist. And, and um, I'm under this white cloth, and I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, I can't spar with this guy. He's so, he's so smart. And I call him my 9-11 prayer, you know, 911 prayer. I just say, oh, Lord, I need help right now, not 10 minutes from now. And, and so I prayed that prayer. And, and the Lord said to me, Walter, share with him like you would share with a four-year-old. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. No, Walter, that's what I want you to do. I want you to share with him like you would share with a little child. Don't try and outmaneuver him. You're not going to. Share with him the gospel like you would a four-year-old. And I'm under this white sheet, and I'm like, oh, and I'm gripping the chairs, you know. And I'm like, you know, Doc, Jesus loves you. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins and your sins. You know, we're all sinners. And... I'm feeling totally foolish. I'm thinking, what's he going to think? And I said, you know, sin is when we disobey and we do things that we shouldn't do. And, 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 and that's what breaks our friendship with God because God loves us. And I was doing this like I would share with a four-year-old. And I remember him pulling back this white sheet. And he's dead serious. He looks at me and he says, that is the clearest explanation of the gospel I have ever heard. He said, I've spent hours talking with men in my college dorm, a man who was a Christian. He said, and, and he said, I have never heard anything like that before. See, God took that word and worked it in his heart. And months later, Jane and I are in a little restaurant up in the middle of Portland, Maine, crowded, cold, freezing cold day, and we like this little chowder restaurant right on the waterfront, and Jane says, let's go over and get chowder. It's a great idea. We go in, and, and it's packed because it's hot chowder and it's freezing outside. And, and I remember trying to work my way to the, the restroom and there was this gentleman there and it was the chairs are blocking the aisles and I'm trying to work on it. He says, let me get up. And he gets up and he moves the chair aside and uh, let's, let's, lets me go walking by. And I'm walking by like this and we come face to face, like this far apart. And I said, you look familiar. And he says, yeah. He says, you look familiar too. I said, I don't know how I know you. I mean, this is where we're up in Portland, Maine. And then all of a sudden, he puts his finger on my face. He says, I did that. <laughs> and he turns to his wife. He said, this is the guy I was telling you about. Now, I don't know what that seed did. It's not about us. It's about him. God loves him. God loves her. It is God's word that changes lives. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear sprout and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me 
empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. It doesn't matter how you get God's word out. There's a million different ways of sharing God's word with others. You know, you get those envelopes in the mail every week, right? You've heard me share this before probably. Get those envelopes in the mail, you know, self-addressed, stamped envelopes, you know. And what you do, they're free. You take a track, something with God's word in it. This is God's word. And, and you put it in an envelope, you know, send it back. Why? Because there's somebody working in an insurance company somewhere. It's going to open that envelope and say, ha, what's this? Throw it on the desk, but at break time, you just don't know that they might not pick it up and read it. And as God's word goes into their life, it will not return to him empty without it accomplishing what he's had to do. There are a million different ways we can share our faith with others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at your word today. This is our prayer that you are glorified through it. Help us to be the witnesses that we're called to be. Help us to, to see that the fields are white unto harvest. And Lord, help us to be warriors of prayer, to pray for the harvest. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.